Satnam, yogis and yoginis. Hello and welcome back to one more stream. Satnam Infinite Stories. And yes, thank you very much. I hit, I think it was yesterday, we hit a thousand subscribers in the channel. I'm uh, very pleased, very excited that it's happening like this. And, um, you know, a thousand subscribers for YouTube is always like a milestone for any content creator. So it's lovely to see that. Now I'm seeing a live caption on my monitor. There, out. So yeah, very excited. And um, maybe tomorrow we can celebrate it a little bit more. And uh, today we're going to go into the topic of today, seven sins and seven chakras. And um, But yes, indeed, everyone, thank you for subscribing. Thank you for some of you who are members and uh, you support also economically to the channel. This is... Um, uh, a lovely project that I have and that I'm, you know, giving all my energy and I'm glad to see that there's people watching. It's not just me here <laughs> talking to the void. So today we're going to do something special, seven chakras, seven sins. It is not a coincidence, but um, yeah, the, the, seven, the concept of the seven sins is not in every tradition, it's not in every religion. There is other traditions which will speak of five evils or five thieves or five passions, things like that. But in Christianism, we have the seven sins. And because it's such a core concept of Christianism, I think it's worth exploring that. My objective today is to explore how every one of these sins is connected to a chakra in the way that when this chakra is not functioning in the most elevated way, this can manifest as a sin. I, I had a comment near uh, recently uh, on my YouTube channel asking me how to use the chakras. I, I, I didn't reply yet, but I was going to say I will do something about this on the next video. So uh, I'm going to cover this. We don't really use the chakras. We, I mean, we don't, we don't utilize the chakras as a, as a key or as an instrument, but the chakras are always present. They are always active in some way. And the chakras can be balanced or imbalanced, full of nice, healthy energy, or it can be toxic energy. And uh, every chakra is associated to a certain kind of um, personality aspect or a certain archetypal way of thinking or behaving. And so when you are operating from a specific chakra, you are behaving in a certain way. We all have all the chakras, so that means we all have this uh, flexibility to, to, to behave in one way or another, but how that behavior happens depends on um, your attitude and in relationship to what's happening in that chakra. It, it may sound a little bit philosophical or a little bit abstract right now, it will become more, more concrete as soon as we start going into the sins. Now, the word sin is a word that I don't particularly like, but uh, let, me, let me say what it, what it def how it's defined. I was reading... The definition today, it's called an immoral act <clears throat> considered to be a transgression against divine law. This is the, trans the, the definition that I got from the internet, the first one that came up. So immoral act considered to be a transgression against divine law. Now, for us as yogis and yoginis, it is not my intention, it's actually the opposite of my intention to do this video in order for us to feel guilty about the things that we do wrong. Now we know I have been exploring mind games in this channel a few videos back. By the way, we will go more into the numbers very soon. We are dealing with the mind so that we can relate to the numbers in a healthy way and it's necessary. As soon as we go into number five, we will go really deep into the numbers. But, uh, oh, we still have this from the last day. Hold on a second. We are not chanting today. So um, we were seeing mind games and we don't want to go into shame and pride. So when we are going to be talking about the seven sins, it's not in order to feel guilty about it or pr proud because we don't have that one. This is not the objective. Now, this concept of an immoral act in yoga is something much more pragmatic. The vision of yoga is, look, if you do a certain kind of act, that's going to have a repercussion. That's going to have a consequence. We call it karma. So when you are reading the Yoga Sutras, like Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, and he talks about these five uh, yamas, five niyamas, you can read it as a 
moral code and how to be a moral person, a moral yogi. But you can also read it like, look, we want to get liberated. The, the liberation means liberation from our karmas. So if you want to get liberated, the first thing you should do is stop creating karma. And how do we create karma? Well, there is these elements that if you do that, it, you are creating karma. So why not avoid doing that, right? Like, for example, asteya, don't steal, right? If you are not stealing, you're not creating that karma. So it's very pragmatic. It's not about going into the ethics, uh, this is wrong, but it's more about, look, you don't want to do that. It's against your own interest, right? Even if you think you are benefiting on the short term, if you're stealing something, now you have something you didn't have before, it's actually going against you because you're going to be punished for that by this universal law of karma. So when we are going to be talking about the seven sins, these are seven states of being, let's say, Seven is linked to our attitude. And these states of being are going to be very karmic. So out of these states, many karmic actions come out. So uh, it is recommended to avoid these seven things. And so Christianity is always very much pushing on the feeling guilty. And then you have to redeem yourself. And for that, you have to um, you know, go to the church and pray and so on. In yoga, we take it in a different perspective. We take it like you have to forgive yourself and just stop creating karma, forgive yourself, and then do at, as, as much as you can a dharmic life. So it's a different perspective, but still those seven concepts, seven points, seven sins, or, you know, in other traditions are five, they are still very relevant. And so let us talk about them today because we are still with number seven, and so, let us relate them to the chakras. So what I'm going to do is, first we draw the, the human body with the seven chakras, and then we're going to explore every chakra and understand what kind of scene is manifesting when we are in the worst possible uh, manifestation of that chakra. So when that chakra is more blocked or more toxic energy is manifesting in some particular way. That's the objective of today. So let me draw a yogi. And let's call this seven sins and seven chakras. There we go. So let me get the colors. Let's write it like this. First chakra. And I will explain every chakra what it is. What are the main characteristics? Even though I am aware that many people who watch this channel are already yogis or yoginis, I even salute you as such, even though I didn't have to, because maybe some people who are not necessarily practicing uh, yoga could be interested as well. I think this is interesting to anyone. But if you're already a yogi, you already know this. But I think it's good if we remind ourselves some of the qualities of this chakra so that when I go into the, into the um, sin, it will make sense. Five is blue. And then which color should I use? This one. That's the sixth. And finally, that's the seventh. All right, so these are the seven chakras. All right. Well, let's talk about the first chakra, first of all. Now, the first chakra in the base of the spine and looking downwards, you, all the chakras are looking horizontally, like in a projection forward towards the front of the body in a spiral way, except the bottom and the top. The bottom one is looking downwards, so the energy that comes out of it is kind of like that. 
and the top one is the opposite. The bottom one could be our material connection and the top our spiritual connection. And all the others are projecting forward. So it would be kind of like this. Yeah. Going forward like that. In a spiral. The second chakra goes a little bit up before going forward. But all the others are straight. There's also a projection backwards towards the back of the body, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk about that today. Now this one is the one that is associated to the third eye. But we will get there in time. Let's let's start from the, the bottom. Yeah? First chakra. Now it's linked down downwards, so that means this connection to the earth. And um, the, the first chakra is giving us stability, is giving us strength because it connects to the earth element. That's, that's another thing. We have, there is the five elements linked to the first five chakras. So that's going to give us a clue also to the, the five sins that are associated to them. So we can already put those elements here, ether. Ether is vibration, so linked to the voice where we speak, air. Linked to the air, the lungs are next to the fourth chakra, where the heart is. Fire, like the digestive fire around the region of the third chakra. Water, linked to the, the kidneys in the back and to the uh, bladder and also sexuality, which is a very humid, humid um, aspect. And finally, earth. So because the first chakra is linked to the earth, it gives us this stability and um, the, it, it sustains us, it supports us, it stabilizes us, it strengthens us, yeah? it's stable and strong. This is all linked to the earth. Now, of all the elements, the earth is the more peaceful and quiet and relaxed and calm because it's is the element that doesn't move. All the others have some sort of movement, yeah? Water is particularly moving, it's flowing downwards. Air is flowing anywhere that you, it, it can, it, it tries to expand anywhere. Fire also tries to expand. And ether is a constant movement in vibration. So earth is the element that is more calm, more relaxed, more peaceful. Now that is already giving us clues to what of the seven scenes would be. Because there is one scene which is being peaceful, but actually so peaceful, so peaceful that you become passive. Yeah, you can be peaceful and then slowly uh, cross into the passivity, what in yoga would say an excess of tamas, yeah, the, one of the gunas, tamasic, very tamasic. And that's sloth. That's one of the, one of the five, uh, sorry, seven sins. So let's put it here. And let me read a definition or um, some of the things that I read online. I, I tried to find definitions for every one of them just to see if I could align it more clearly to the seven chakras. So let me say, let me read what it says here. A number of things that I found in, in Wikipedia I was checking. Sloth, absence of intent. Sorry, of interest. Absence of interest. So when you are... When you're very tamasic and it's difficult to get up in the morning, difficult to do things, difficult to initiate things, you will start to recognize in the word initiate, like initiate, in, the um, initiating is related to number one because you start something, yeah? The beginnings and starts is number one. Initiating is something one. is the first thing that you do. That you do. So this uh, lack of interest is kind of like, like it's more like a lack of, like of uh, Im the impulse to start things. And that's number one, and so it's also connected to the first chakra. It also says here, a disinclination to exertion. So you don't want to do activity, right? So that's clearly not related to number three. The third chakra, fire, is the chakra of activity. So it's clearly not here, yeah? It's a lack of activity. It's the mind state that leads to boredom, Rancor, apathy, passive inertia, and laziness. Yeah. So 
you are so relaxed that you don't want to do anything and then you become lazy. Now, it's interesting because very often in yoga, well, many people come to yoga because they are overly stressed and they need to relax. And they have a, 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 a first impression of yoga that this is a good way for them to learn to relax. And, and it's true. We learn how to relax doing yoga. But not only that. Yoga is also about learning how to activate yourself when you need to. So you, you can gather the power of the first chakra and relax when you need to and fall asleep. But also the power of the third chakra and activate yourself when you have to. So yoga is not just about being relaxed. And that could be a misconception that some people have. So it's not about being relaxed. But um, when you are relaxing, being able to activate yourself again. Now you may start doing yoga and you become so relaxed and so calm that nothing is moving you. Then there is no vitality. I did a video on this. Uh, I think it was called the triangle of relaxation, activity and vitality, something like that, or relaxation, stress and vitality. You can find that video in the channel if you want. And it's about this, finding a balance between one and the other. Now, when you don't have the balance in the relaxed area of the triangle, it was a triangle that I drew, when you are imbalanced in that area, then you fall into the sloth. Yeah? So let me read again. The absence of interest, disinclination to exertion, a mindset that leads to boredom, rancor, apathy, passive inertia, and laziness. So being lazy. Yeah? So all right, that seems to coincide pretty clearly. I think that's quite easy to uh, align. Not all of them will be like this. We will see that later on there is a few scenes which are, they could be interexchanged a little bit, but I think the way I've situated them will, be, will, be, will make sense. But okay, we have one situation. Let's go to the second chakra. Second chakra is related to the water, and second chakra is um, related to needs. Let me explain why. When you go into the, in the, into the number two, you find that first there was one and now there is two. And when you go from the one to the two, something separates, something divides, divide. So two, D, divide, yeah? And when something is divided in two, then there is an empty space in between. And that emptiness of number two is a reflection of that we are lacking something. So... It's very interesting that it's connected to the second chakra with number two, because in the second chakra, for the woman particularly, that's where the womb is. So an emptiness over there. And, and, but even for men, being connected to water, the water element is the element that, that is like cleaning out. We use the element of water to clean. And when you are emptying, yeah, water seems to clean and empty. Now, that is the chakra that is going to connect a lot with that feeling of emptiness and void. So when we are very void, when we are very empty, we feel sad, like we are lacking something. We feel a certain longing. And that longing is, is a good thing to have because we need that sadness to empower our meditation. We say from emotion to devotion, but initially it will feel like something's wrong. It will feel like something that you need to fill that void. You want to fill that void. And so sometimes when people are very depressed or very much going into that hole, they will fill it in with things, material things like food and, and um, um, work, could be sex, yeah, anything that can fill the void, let's say. But being in contact with the void, that's something specifically for the second chakra. Sexuality is also connected to the second chakra. It's watery thing. It's a watery quality. And the water element, it's linked also to energy because energy flows like water. So any kind of form of energy, being it sex, power, money. Money is a form of energy. Yeah, you have more money. You can buy more, let's say, petrol for your car so you can drive farther. So you have more energy if you have more money. And power as well. You have more power. You have the energy to drive the world, to change the world around you. And that's a good thing. We want to be able to empower ourselves. Yeah. Let's not see power just as this corruption thing. Yeah. Power is also necessary. So, all right. This is a, an overall description of the second chakra. Now, 
there is also a very clear sin that is connected to this, and that is lust. Now let me read what lust says here. In the definition from Wikipedia, I, that's the one I will be reading all this um, today. Intense longing. Now that's interesting. Eh? I just mentioned about this longing, and actually one of the, the higher ways of relating to the second chakra, we, to number two, let's say, not the second chakra, but to number two, is when we say longing to belong. Yeah? You long to belong to something. And you want to belong to the human race, you want to belong to a group, you want to belong to, to some divine sangat, let's say. So you want to belong to something. So intense longing. Unbridled desire. Now desires come out of needs. Yeah? You have a need or a necessity, that's what is uh, connecting to the second chakra, this void that we feel inside. And out of that need, then we have this desire. Yeah? And it can be sexual desire, but not just. It can be just some form of desire. And in the, in the Wikipedia, it says it's sexual or also for money or power. And we call these the, the, this is the three traps. You can fall into a trap looking for um, an, in, an imbalance in relation, to, in, in, in relation sorry, to sex, power, or money. Yeah? And an imbalance in relation to sex, power, or money. Now, the three things are in relationship to energy and they are in relationship to the second chakra. So, lasting for money, lasting for power, lasting for sex. That means that this is the last, is when the second chakra is more out of balance. Yeah? Sloth would be the first one going out of balance. I was talking about that triangle between relaxation and stress and, and vitality. So this would be an imbalance here going in this direction. And the second chakra would be an imbalance in relationship to this longing, taking it to uh, looking for and desiring more and more of sex, power, money, that region. There we go. All right. Hopefully it's clear. If you have questions, so if you want to uh, say what you are feeling about what I'm saying, you can write in the chat or write in the comments of the video. But we have two sins. I think these are quite clearly defined. Let's go to the third one. The third one is fire. The third chakra is fire. Let me define a little bit about the third chakra, and then we will see what kind of sin is related to that one. Now, the third chakra is the chakra of activity. Fire is the energy that moves something. Yeah? We said in the second chakra comes the source of the energy. Now from in the third chakra is where does this energy go? The fire is like the fire of um, engines, the fire of, that fuels a machine, the fire that is going to move the pistons of a motor, of an engine, to move the car. So the third chakra is connected to movement and action, activity. And the fire can be, can be something warm and nice, or it can be something too hot and burning. Okay, let's take it like that. When the fire is nice, is the fire of friendliness, which is linked to humor as well. Being happy and being, being smiley, yeah, that's uh, the, the emotion linked to the fire element. When I was saying about the water, sadness linked to water, tears, right? Fire is laughter. Ha, ha, ha. When we laugh, our belly moves. If you laugh too much, right, then your belly is painful. Why? Because you are moving a lot this third chakra, right? The navel is moving. So navel and friendliness would be connected to this fire and uh, activity. Well, there is one sin, which is not action, but a reactive fire, which does not warm, but burns and does not become friendly, but actually the enemy, and that's wrath. Wrath. So let me describe, sorry, let me read the definition for wrath that I found. An uncontrolled, uncontrolled feelings of anger, rage, and hatred, in which you often wish and seek revenge. It says also that hatred 
is a desire to harm someone. Can you relate that to fire? Is it clear? I mean, is it connected to water? Is it connected to air? How do you feel? Hatred. Does it feel more like an airy quality, like an earthy quality? It feels like fire, doesn't it? Hatred. When you feel the anger, when you feel the hate inside, how does your body feel? It feels hot. It warms up from the inside. So that's, that's the third chakra being really active, but in an aggressive, burning, violent and burning way, let's say. Now, which not all of these qualities that I'm saying are negative, but all of them together in this way, they become very negative. Now, you don't, you don't want, uh, how, how was the hate thing? The desire to harm someone. You don't do that to your friends, right? So the, warm, the warmth of happiness and humor, which is the highest qualities of the third chakra, that becomes fire, which is, this is like when you have somebody who is a cynic, you know, it maybe started with a little bit of, um, how do you say that? Satirical, there's, a, there's another word for that. Before it becomes cynicism, what's the word? I'm not sure what the word is now. But, you know, you are saying something, but you are making fun of it. It's not, you're not really saying it seriously, but you're actually kind of saying it seriously. Sometimes we say with a joke the things that are most serious, right? So um, this kind of, um, kind of funny joke becomes a very serious and be becomes not funny, right? And that's when it becomes very... The cynic very qu quickly goes into... becomes very acidic, let's say. It's like um, you don't want to be next to them. You know, a little bit of humor, dark hu even dark humor is healthy. It's really great. But sometimes that humor becomes burning and becomes just... Um, you can feel the anger behind. Sometimes it's passive aggression, right? So... There is a wrath behind that. And there is, I think wrath is even farther than, than anger, right? Anger would, I would say anger is already here, but wrath is already with a certain intent to harm and already almost like um, mixed with hate. Yeah. <clears throat> now, when it, was, when it was just anger, anger is a, yeah, sarcastic. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Infinite Stories. That's it. Sarcasm. Great. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. So you can be sarcastic and um, it's healthy. I like sarcasm uh, and uh, it can, you can use it with humor and it's wonderful. When it becomes cynicism, then it's more toxic for ourselves and for what we are doing to the other. So yeah, sarcastic. Thank you. Uh, interesting. I was just noticing how you write sarcastic and it's very similar to sak sukra, sukra, sukram in, in, um, I think, I think is, um, Arabic for thank, for thank you. Yeah. But it's also very similar to sukra in Catalan means sugar. So sarcasm, how interesting. Yeah. Is this same sounds as sugar, but it, it becomes, you know, the sweetness of the sugar can become very easily acidic in the cynicism. Yeah. Something like that. But anger can be healthy. It can be, well, in a certain way, right? When we are, it's a, what I mean is that all the emotions in the root, they are useful for us in an, from an evolutionary st standpoint. If they evolved with us, it's because they were useful. Otherwise, they would not be with us, right? Natural selection would have made sure to eradicate anybody with hunger. Now, why was anger useful? Because if you have to fight, if a predator comes and you have to define, defend your tribe, you better, you better channel your anger to fight. So the anger comes as a defense mechanism. And, um, but yeah, this anger, this fire can be uncontrollable and then it becomes, it burns everything. So it may start like a passive aggression and then eventually you are with a cynicism or, or with an active aggression, you can um, burn many people around us. So wrath, wrath, clearly fire, isn't it? I think it's clearly fire, lust, water, sloth, sleep, like the earth. Yeah, I think it's quite clear.
Now we are coming to the fourth chakra. Let's go into the air. And the fourth chakra is the chakra of the heart. And this is the chakra that makes us more human. The first three are more connected to our animal side. When we go into the heart, we're going into connecting to the other humans around us and the most empathetic qualities of the heart, the compassionate qualities, where we are going to be connecting to some other person and feel their pain or feel what they are feeling and want to relate to them in that human way. If we have something and somebody doesn't have it, we're going to want to share with them to alleviate their pain. That's coming from the heart. Yeah? It's a compassionate giving. The heart wants to embrace, wants to hold, wants to caress, wants to touch, wants to hug. Yeah? This is what the, the arms are an extension of the heart. That's why in yoga, when we are doing exercises with the arms, we are stimulating the heart chakra. So there's a connection between arms and the heart. The heart is a wonderful feeling. It's related to the element of air and the air can touch you like when you blow on the skin. But it's also invisible in some ways. Yeah? You cannot see it. It just touches you. I'm already giving many clues to what we will do with the numbers later on when we go to explore the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, but we're not going to go too much into that today. Let's stay. Element of air is touching, is nice, is caressing. All right. From the heart, you give and you share. Now, let's imagine that the heart is corrupt. Yeah, like we were doing with the other chakras. This energy will turn around. Now, from the emptiness that we may be feeling down here in the second chakra, remember here, when you are in the first one, you are very passive. It's like you're waiting for the world to do things for you, like almost like you deserve everybody to serve you in some way. Now, there is an emptiness inside, and you're hoping to fill this in in some particular way. If you don't get the, the emptiness filled, then you're going to get angry. You follow? Yeah? So I'm very passive, expecting the world to satisfy my needs. I have these needs. If they don't get filled, I'm going to be angry. Yeah? And if I find a way to get them, I'm going to want to really fill the void. I'm going to want more and more and more. And that, as, as we go into the heart, it will become the hands that go out to caress and to touch, and to offer, and to give, and to share, they become grasping and taking. So this is like, there is always like this bidirectional flow with every one of these chakras. You can see this with the Karmendriyas and Gyanendriyas as well. If you are familiar with this concept from yoga, Indriyas has the sense of um, hearing, listening, uh, uh, I'm saying hearing, listening, and pointing to my eyes. This is kind of funny. But yeah, seeing as well, speaking, yeah. Uh, sorry, hearing. So hearing is going in, but speaking is going out. So this, this would be like going in and going out. So the feeling of touch is how you feel, how things are touching you. In the karmendriya, the going out, the action, the indriya of going out, the sense of action would be going and touching and holding and grasping. And in this case, even taking it for yourself. So that's called greed. That's called greed. So, let's write it, right here. Uh, so, the, the same hands which want to touch and want to offer and share, it's you want to hold it close to your chest. Yeah? You are taking it to close your chest. You are closing yourself to protect that. So, gr being greedy. Yeah? So, if I don't get, I have this void, I want to feel it. If I don't get it, I'm going to get angry. But if I have a chance to get it, I'm going to be greedy. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take as much as I can. Now, let me read the, the definition for greed. An inordinate desire to acquire or possess more than one's needs, especially material wealth. So all these, all these sins are building upon each other, right? So it becomes like a whole picture. But then now we are connecting to this material aspect and we want to fill the void. And now I want to fill it as much as I can, even beyond what we need. Because you are concerned with what you need and you don't need when you are looking at others and noticing there's others, there's other needy people and then you want to share with them so that we are all living 
together as humans, no? This is the chakra of community. We are all uh, in a, um, sharing the resources because we want to live together. From the perspective of greed, you don't care about the others. You just care about yourself. Yeah, so it's like very selfish and closing yourself in, closing the heart and closing yourself in. So you are, it's the opposite of the higher quality of the chakra, of the heart chakra, which is empathy and compassion. And which empathy would mean to, pathos is pain. So it's like you are feeling the pain of the others, right? And, and here is like, I don't care about their pain. And then you don't, you don't care if they are needy or not. You just care about feeling yourself even beyond your needs. So that's, that links very well con greed, even though we will see another one later, another scene, which could also connect to the heart very well. And that's because also these two chakras, the fourth and the sixth, sixth sorry, they are always very much connected. For example, when your heart is closed, when the heart is closed, when we are in fear, for example, right? Fear is the opposite of love. Heart is love, right? So when the fear comes in, then we, it's, it's really, really difficult to have an intuition because the fourth and the sixth chakra are connected. So if your heart is closed, if you are in fear, try to have an intuition of where to go. That's really, really hard. So if you want to have this intuitive perception of where the path is going to lead us, this clarity of vision, which is going to give us the sixth chakra, you need to open your heart. This is a, a connection between the four and the six. This is not a coincidence. When we were exploring numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I mentioned those numbers which add up to 10 are connected. So four and six is connected. So it's not a coincidence that the heart chakra and the third eye have a strong resonance with each other. Even though I mentioned with numbers that in reality, every chakra is not one number, but three numbers. This would be one, two, three, two, three, four, three, four, five. Yeah, we can, we can write it. But because we haven't explored the language of numbers yet, it's not going to help as much. Yeah, but this would be one, two, three. But we haven't really explored what is one, what is two, what is three. So it's gonna, that's going to come. This course is going to be long. I already mentioned it's, it's going to take a while. We are with number seven. We are doing 10 videos on number seven before we will move to the next number. This would be four, five, six. But yeah, because we haven't explored yet what are these qualities that I'm writing, of these numbers that I'm writing, then it's difficult to have a full conversation about what does this mean. But maybe when we can build our language, our vocabulary a bit more, then we may revisit some of these diagrams and we may complement them with more information. But yeah, as I mentioned, the sixth one is going to be resonating with the four because six and, six and four are ten. And then the seven is going to complement the three, seven plus three is 10. So we're going to see that the seven and the three are also connected in some way. But okay, let's go on. Let's go to the fifth chakra. Let's describe the fifth chakra for a little bit first. Fifth chakra is connected to ether. Ether is vibration. The fifth chakra is the chakra of communication, because it vibrates, because it makes sound, and is connected to the ears as well. Yeah, The fifth chakra is regulating what enters through the ears. That means that we are listening as well. That's why it's a communication. Uh, something else, the ears, you know, we have the labyrinth and other little bones, and this is where we find our balance. Interesting, huh? Because it's not the first chakra which gives us balance. The first chakra gives us like the base, that's earth. It gives us stability. But balance is found in number five. If you have number five and one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, it's here that you're trying to find the balance, yeah, between one side and the other, between the personal and the impersonal, and so on. So it's interesting that. In the body, the balance is found in the ear, which is connected to the throat, which is vibration, which is sound. 
So when this chakra is, um, if I may say it again, balanced, <laughs> it's about balance in all the areas, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. This is all related to the fifth chakra. Um, the fifth chakra would say, if it's balanced, is like you eat your meals every day, you have a balanced diet and everything is healthy. When it's out of balance with the, in this chakra, you may be like one day you eat too much, another day you eat too little. Yeah, I'm too full. I'm not going to eat anything. Now I'm not going to have dinner. Then the next morning you are super hungry. You have a huge breakfast. Then you don't really feel for lunch. You only have a sandwich. Then for dinner again, you are super hungry. So it's like going up and down and up and down, like, like a roller coaster. And look, a roller coaster is a vibration, isn't it? It's like sound. It's a wave. So it's very interesting, that connection. What else? The fifth chakra, it also becomes a filter. We should be able to filter our words, the words that come out, and filter what we choose to listen, what comes in. But we can see this also with the food. You're going to... Hopefully you are smelling the food that you eat, right? <laughs> you see it, you smell it, you put it in your mouth... And if it has to go in, it will go in through the throat, right? The throat should be the filter, say, oh, <clears throat> this is not for me, and then you spit it out. But the garganta, we say in Spanish, g -g, yeah? This is the, the um, gola, yeah? In other languages, it's like g -g, this g sound, which is a guttural sound, which comes from the G, the K and the G sounds. They are associated to the throat. All right, I said enough. So with what I said... What is the sin? <laughs> well, I think you see where I'm going when I'm doing this emphasis on the G sound. I think it will not be a surprise that I say it's gluttony, which is eating a lot. And I mean, we could kind of see gluttony also in the third chakra because this is where the stomach is, this is where digestion is, and this is a fire. But uh, I see wrath much more linked to the fire and I see gluttony more to the five. This is like, gluttony is like, rather than speaking the word, I'm eating the world. Right? Rather than speak the word, I'm eating the world. And you're swallowing it. Boom, gluttony. Let me read what it says. Gluttony. An overindulgence, an overconsumption of anything. Typically food, but anything to the point of waste, to the point of waste. So it's talking about wasting resources, right? You are eating too much. You know that the human body cannot process too much food. So sometimes these huge meals that one may do, you go to this, you know, maybe there is a banquet, there is a party and they are celebrating somebody's wedding or whatever, and there's so much food and there's dishes everywhere. And, you know, it, it's going to go inside, and the body is going to extract some of the nutrients that it can, and everything else is going to go out as waste. And all these resources, when there's people hungry, and you are just wait, wasting them, right? So it's a waste of resources. It's an imbalance with, with the natural world around us, right? It's consuming more and more and more without caring whether this is sustainable or not. So these five, we should be harmony and balance. You're getting out of balance between you and the natural world around you. So overindulgence and overconsumption of anything, typically food, to the point of waste. It comes from the gluttony, comes from the Latin glutire. Yeah? Glutire, which means to gulp down, gulp. So, you know, going through the throat. Gorging of prosperous... What's that? Ah, the guarding of people who are prosperous leaves the needy hungry. And we, we come in contact with the needy again. Remember, greed is taking more than you need. Taking more than you need. Remember how angry you are because you want to fill your needs. So let's go back to the beginning. I'm very passive. I hope, hope that the world satisfies my, my needs. Whatever has to happen, the world will do it for me because I'm very passive. As you go into the two, 
The hunger arises, the hunger wakes up, the lust wakes up. Now I want to fill that void, that need. And now if I don't get it filled soon, I'm going to get angry. And I'm going to use my anger to manipulate those around me to satisfy my needs. Yeah? I'm going to feel entitled for everybody to serve me because I'm hungry. So you have to cater for me. Yeah? That's a very baby behavior, right? Nothing, <laughs> I'm not saying anything wrong about babies. I'm just saying when people don't mature out of that state, they, they hope that people satisfy whenever they need it. Yeah, very entitled. Now, if I get it, I'm going to be greedy. I'm going to take as much as I want, even beyond my needs. And I'm going to be glutton. Yeah, glutton. You know, blum, blum, swallow, swallow, swallow. And waste so many resources. Something that you could even use later. Instead of having one big, huge meal that you're not going to receive all the nutrients of it. Why not, you know, make three meals? But no, if you are prosperous, then you don't care about the needy and you can afford it and you just have a huge meal. What's, what's that? That's a overly swallowing, swallowing, which is taking in through the mouth. So that's an, an imbalance in the fifth chakra where you should be establishing a healthy filter of what goes in and what doesn't go in. Rather than that, you're just swallowing the world yeah? to try to appease the, the hunger monster which is very often going to be linked to the stress monster. As you get stressed, yeah, this is more like depressed. Yeah, the water element and the tears, this is more going to be stressed, the fire. And as the hole gets bigger, the inner stress gets higher, the stress monster wakes up, now you're going to fill the monster with whatever. Then you find yourself munching on the chocolate bar when you didn't want to do it. You were committing yourself to wait until lunchtime to have a proper meal. And, and instead of that, you didn't even realize your hand went to the, to the drawer and then chocolate bar in the mouth. So first of all, don't put the chocolate bars in the drawer, right? <laughs> and, and second, because otherwise, you know, they are too available for when the stress monster wakes up. Then rum, 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 gluttony, right? The fifth chakra not exerting the filter that it should and then being out of balance within natural world around me. Make sense? I think it makes sense. Should we move on? Sixth chakra. All right, let's talk a little bit about the sixth. Sixth chakra is, is what often is drawn as a third eye. It's actually more in the center of the head. It's not really in the third eye, but the, there is a projection towards the front, and yes, there is this idea of a symbol of a third eye. And it's the use as an eye because it's what gives us this uh, capacity to see something that is not readily seen, is not easy to be seen. We, we say it to see the unseen or to see the invisible. Is the eye that is going to give us a perception of something that is hidden or something that is coming in the future. Yeah, it's an intuitive perception of something that is not yet to come, has, has not come yet, is yet to come, or something that is hidden from view. So that intuitive perception is associated, the third eye, to clarity. And that, because of its position within the mind, it's also giving mental clarity. And, you know, this capacity to see in which direction should I move. So if I'm making, you know, I have to make a decision and I have various possibilities. And if I'm tuning in, I can see intuitively in which direction can I move in. And with that clarity, then I can start making plans and organize myself to move on. But uh, yeah, that's kind of connected in that way. Uh, so let's see, what could it be? All these qualities? Well, I'm going to associate that. And this is the, the one scene that I felt it was more... Dodgy. It wasn't a hundred percent, but I'm gonna put it here. Envy. Now this is the one that I, I mentioned. It's so close to greed that it could have been also in the fourth chakra just as well. I could see it in the fourth chakra as well. Now I see it in the envy, and I will I will connect it because of uh, the, some of the description. Uh, let me read the definition. But let's remember one one thing first. The number four and the six, they are very, very close together. Of all the numbers, they are the two that are closest to the five, four and six. So one and nine are much more distant than four and six. Four and eight, uh, two and eight are also connected, 
but they are much more distant than, two and, than four and six. Same with three and seven. No? So four and six are really, really close. And we will find it more and more as we go into numbers that sometimes you are walking one, two, three, four, you cross the five in an instant and you find yourself in the six already. You cross it really quickly. So to me, it makes sense that the qualities of, of an imbalance in the fourth and the sixth chakra are so close together. But yeah, but why did I finally put it here in the six and not in the four? As I mentioned, four is the hands, is sharing, and the opposite is greed, is taking. But in envy, it's not so much about taking, it's about what you see and what you desire, but from your vision. So that would be more linked to the eyes. Rather than to the hands, greed would be more about taking, but envying is like seeing something from somebody else and wanting it for yourself. Let me read the definition of envy anyway. So it's an insatiable desire. But I mean, this desire started in the very beginning, right? The desire is behind all of this. Remember, if you look at the, um, the Four Noble Truths from Buddhism, right? they talk about there is, an, uh, there is a suffering, and that starts with a certain desire and an attachment yeah, to that desire. So desire is in the core root of all these problems that arise, that are leading us in the path of these sins, or sinful behavior, if you want to call it like that. So desire is everywhere. But yeah, insatiable desire, like greed, like lust, covetousness towards the traits or possessions of somebody else. So it's not just material things. The thing is, the more we are down here, the more material it is. Yeah? Sloth is you materially cannot move. You are, you are on bed, you cannot wake up. You wake up, but you cannot get up. You are difficult to activate yourself, to move. Yeah. Last is, is a very physical, very materially physical experience. Last, even if it's sex, sex particularly, but even if it's power or money, this desire, it's a very material and physical experience. Wrath, anger, it's a very physical experience. It's down in our bodies. As we go up, they become less material because remember, this is the material, this is the spiritual. So it becomes more abstract. Yeah. So envy, when you are, you can be envious of um, material wealth from somebody, but you can also be envious of somebody who is good at maths or whatever. You have, you see somebody, you see their traits, which is kind of like seeing what is invisible in the other, and you want that for yourself. You wish you could be like that. You wish you could not just have it, but be like that. So you see, it's much more abstract than some of the material things, like greed. Yeah? It's more abstract, envy. Let me keep reading. So, insatiable desire, covetousness towards the traits or possessions of someone else. Very interesting. It severs a man from his neighbor and brings sorrow to... I'm not sure what I wrote here. Um, sorry. I, I'm, I'm not sure what I said here. Uh, arch to inflict pain upon others as well. With it. So the envy, it, ha it has a certain... Do you remember when we were talking about wrath and hatred, like wanting to harm others? with envy as well. Yeah, there is a um, sadistic quality to it. Yeah, that you want somebody else to suffer. Not just taking what they have, but you want them to suffer as well. So it's going into the sadistic already. I'm, st I'm curious what I wrote. I cannot read my own letter. I don't know what I said. I, I wrote it this morning very early. And um, uh, I... I, it was very dark. <laughs> I was getting darker and darker. As I was going into the seven sins, I was getting darker and darker. Um, that's the danger of this topic. Yeah, when you start going into it, you end up with a headache or something. So we will soon finish. <laughs> All right. So I think it's quite clear. It's something more abstract than greed, but it's also like seeing related to the eyes and the clarity of seeing, but seeing in other something that you want for yourself. So this envy aspect. Okay, let's go to the seventh chakra. Seventh chakra, very, very simply, is our connection to the spiritual. 
I remember when I mentioned that the first chakra was pointing downwards, the others are horizontal, so it's our working on this plane, on this horizontal world that we are living, and the, the seventh is our connection to the spiritual, because it's vertical. This is where the soul comes in, and hopefully the day that we have to depart this planet, our spirit, our soul, will depart through the tenth gate, we call it, yeah, this point here. So it's the spiritual uh, uplifting, spiritual crown, the spiritual crowning. Yeah, we, we want to bring the Kundalini up to the top. So we crown ourselves. That is, crowning ourselves is like finding the best in ourselves and putting that part of ourselves in the top. Yeah, raising our consciousness, raising our Kundalini and consciousness is the same. And to, to have this spiritual connection to something divine, something higher than us. Well, there is one sin missing, and is rather than we connecting to something higher than us, is we thinking we are higher than everybody else. It's really so clear. It's pride. Let's see what it says. Oh, hubris, hubris as well. Very interesting that... In the text, when they talk about pride, it's like the worst of the worst. Yeah, It's given like the worst of the seven sins. It says it's the original sin, the worst of all, the most demonic. It's the opposite of humility. Look, humility is going down towards the earth, right? Bowing down, that's becoming small. And, and pride is becoming big. So, you know, humility would be going down to the one going into the earth, putting your nose on the earth, right? Feeling really small, very little. That's number one, as you grow in numbers. And remember, number seven, when we came, when we were talking about seven, the seven being on top of the platform and thinking they are the top of the world and there's nothing else, that's the false perception of seven. That's the ego mind. There's actually two more numbers, eight and nine. So there's something spiritual, but when you go into the seven, you think there's nothing else because seven colors, seven days of the week, seven musical notes. So you think you are in the top, seven chakras, right? But this is hubris. You think you're at the top. You are. You crown yourself, but you don't crown your self in capital letters, the self, the, the, the sense of existing and being, your satnam. You crown your ego self, the false, the false self, and that's pride. Yeah? Let me keep reading. So the worst of all, of opposite of humility, it is anti-God. It's the ego self directly opposed to God. Yeah? The ego self directly opposed to God. So th that means, look, you are cutting this connection. Yeah, this is seven chakras is our connection to God and this and the divine. Yeah. So you are literally cutting it and putting a crown which is your ego and saying, This is my highest self. It severs the spirit from God. So the spirit came down when we were born, and now it severs the connection. This is like the umbilical cord to the divine. You can see it like that, the umbilical cord to God, and it severs it. It's very, very clear. Yeah? An excessively high opinion of oneself or self-importance. So yeah, excessively high. And you can see it, people lifting their head when they are very proud, right? They lift their head. This is um, why so many people have difficulty relating to posh people. When they are very posh, it's like walking like that. And there is a difference between very proud and and in a, dar in a karmic way, and being able to connect to your own divinity and your own elevation and connect to something divine. In that context, then you can have an elegance, like the elegance of something that goes higher. And I was, um, yeah, I have some images of people who are very, very elegant and very, but in a humble way as well. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to be like squeezing yourself um, in that way, no? So if it starts, it says, does that mean you shouldn't be proud of yourself? Pride is a sin. <laughs> Pride is an evil. Why sh what should you be proud about? You can be, you can be happy that you can overcome um, 
hurdles that you can grow with yourself, that you are overcoming your own limits and getting to your your highest possibilities of yourself, developing your potential to the full. But as soon as you become proud, then you are seeing yourself above others. When you're seeing yourself above others, then there's no equality. And then you're losing the car, econ car, yeah? this we are all one. When we are not equal, then that's when the imbalance starts to happen and many other um, things come out of that. So pride is considered one of the, uh, in this case, one of the sins, but in many traditions is one of the five um, evils. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, all of these, all of these qualities. Okay, let me just point to this. Yeah. Um, all of these sins, even there is a way to translate them, which is going to help to rebalance the chakra and turn it around. So you can transform the sloth into a pacifying of all these things. Yeah? You can bring the sloth into the, the, let's say, the seven sins. You can have a last, not for sex, power, money, but for the teachings. This wrath, this fire, it can be the fire which you put into your practice. This greed, yeah, one more. It can be like I want more, you know, access to the teachings. I want more um, books to read, meditations to do, discipline to perform, right? It's how you take it. Gluttony, you can eat a lot of food or you can devour um, videos <laughs> on YouTube <laughs> related to yoga, right? You can be envious of somebody else's possessions or you can appreciate the qualities and the traits that somebody has and be inspired by them. Let them go into your heart and be inspired by that to move, no? to, 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 to move in the direction to develop your, yourself, the same traits and virtues. You can be proud of yourself and feel yourself above everything or you can be proud of your guru, your God, your teachings and... and feel that you are one to be aligned to that thing which you consider higher. So there is, there is one way to, to kind of transform these seven sins into something that is elevated in some way. And uh, I think that's, that should be kind of like, the, like the, the conclusion we can receive out of that. First of all, Let's go back to the beginning, something I was mentioning at the beginning. Hopefully, hopefully this is clear, yeah? Hopefully it's quite clear, all the, how am I connecting it to the seven chakras? And, I'm, you know, I accept that there could be other interpretations of it, and you could see it in any other way. I'm aligning it to the numbers. I'm align, aligning it to the basic qualities of each chakra. But I'm happy to review if somebody else has a different version. If you have studied a different version, feel free to share it in the chat or in the comments of the video. But hopefully this is clear. But now let's come back to something we were saying in the beginning. <clears throat> this is not to feel bad our, about ourselves. Let's remember one thing. We are not perfect. Nobody is perfect. So um, let's assume that we commit mistakes. We make mistakes. And then from here, then let's start with the forgiveness towards ourselves and towards others and move from there. Yeah? Let's not take this list of sins just to punish ourselves. Yeah. <clears throat> now, the seven sins, as I mentioned, this is something that is more from the uh, Christian tradition. If we look at other, I don't know if I wanted to do this or not, but if you look, for example, in the Sikh Dharma, and you will see something similar in the Buddhist teachings and some other places, they would talk about Kam, which is... Uh, Desire, this is where Kama Sutra comes from, the word Kam. Desire to the extreme becomes lust, yeah? And you could say that this is a challenge to go up into the second chakra. And Krot would be going up into the third chakra. Kam, Krot, Lop, like greed or avarice. Yeah, it's kind of the same. These three are basically, these three is basically the same. 
Now here there is one, moh, that is not linked to the seven sins. It's called attachment. Attachment, yeah? Which in another video I talked about there's the three different kinds of attachment. There's a material, emotional, and spiritual attachment. But in any case, attachment is stopping us from reaching our potential. And then going to the top, we have a hankar, which is translated often as pride. Even though we know that a hankar is one of the functions of the mind, the one, but we could say here, a hankar, I am, dar, kar is doing. So I am the one who is doing things. So that's the pride kind of feeling. God has nothing to do. I make my own luck, right? So that's a hankar in that way. And this would be, these are called the five, we can say the five thieves or passions, or sometimes they are called the five evils. I have another video where I mentioned the five thieves, yeah? So it's, it's these ones. But you can see it's like going up the chakras as well. So it's very, very similar. And you will find this also in, as I mentioned, in Buddhism and other traditions. The concept is that there is a number of attitudes that if you do them, you are going to be generating karma and it's going actually against you because even if you have a certain short-term pleasure, you're going to have a long-term pain and suffering as a result of that. And we know that on a very biological way, we are designed to avoid pain and seek pleasure. But in a, on a spiritual way, if you want to look far, you're going to have to look for ways to find happiness in the long term and avoid the... the it's, not, it's not about pleasure, it's about happiness, right? So avoid falling into the traps that are going to bring you more suffering in the end. Now, this connects really well with the topic that I'm going to be exploring probably in the next video on this course, which would be seven steps to heaven and seven steps to hell. I'm not sure whether I will do two videos or just one and do everything because it's a lot, but let's, we will identify which are the steps that are going to bring us down into hell. It's kind of Dantesque, Dantesque <laughs> topic. And also the seven steps that are going to bring us to heaven. When I say heaven, the, the highest heaven is true spiritual happiness. Yeah, true, true happiness, not temporal pleasure. So that will be the seventh step of this going up to heaven, let's say. And we will see which, let's say, we will identify every one of the steps that are bringing us to hell. Uh, because hell, hell and heaven is something that we're going to ex experience here in this life. It's not about what you're going to be living when you depart and maybe you meet some, who knows what is after death. We will talk about that some of the time. But it's about this life. You can experience heaven or hell depending on your actions and your attitudes. So why not understand the things that are going to take us to hell and when we detect them, change them to move towards heaven. Would that sound like something interesting? I think it is. <laughs> so we will do that in the next video. Uh, well, the next video after I come back, I'm going to be awake for a whole week. I'm going to Dubai to teach a, a teacher training. So I'm excited. It's the first time I go to Dubai. I'm looking forward to, to seeing what's going to be there. And um, so I will not be recording any videos. I will post one recording that I will prepare, uh, a past recording that is, has been filtered and prepared for, for YouTube. And, um, but yeah, tomorrow we are still meeting. Tomorrow we will have a, a live stream. We will celebrate 1,000 subscribers. I uh, really appreciate everybody's contribution, everybody being here. If you want to support the channel, you can become a member. You, if you appreciate that this, this video, I do a lot of effort preparing this material. I put many hours of research and meditation for everything that I share here. And it, everything is offered as a service. But if you want to contribute to the channel, you can think about becoming a member and donating from as little as, I think it's like $3 or 3 euros a month, I think, to, which is more or less what you would pay if you were inviting me for a tea, right? If you appreciated this, it's like, okay, come on, Ardas, I take you for a tea. Or if you were 
Uh, you can, um, depending on the tier that you wish to support, then you can give up to what you would give to a, um, a yoga class, a studio. If you were paying monthly to a yoga studio, then you would be paying something like that. So um, just opportunities for you to support. And I appreciate any kind of support. Even if you don't, you don't have to become a member, you just share what you, what you, you know, share this channel with others. Let them know that this exists, that we are talking about yoga, that these are very interesting topics, if you find them interesting. And let's keep growing. It is... Um, I am honored to be here, to be part of this uh, um, channel and this chain, right? I received it. I'm offering it to you. That's coming on to you. So you can offer it to others as well. And thank you very much. Thank you for everybody subscribed and supporting and being here watching this video. Until next time, Sadnam. Thank <laughs> you.